Welcome to this If Oxford events to explore a political topic and how the pandemic has influenced our understanding of democracy and indeed the role and nature of democracy itself. So it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Crypto Nicolides, uh, who is going to be leading on this event. Uh, and I'll be in the background helping with a few bits and pieces. And I'd like to pass over to Calypso. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Very nice to see you. And we are indeed here to have a conversation. Um, we've all been going through this terrible pandemic for the last almost two years. Um, and it has done a lot to our personal lives, as well as to our lives in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our countries, our regions, how we are together. And today we want to, um, through the IF Festival, because it's a festival that is uh, traditionally together and having conversation to try to make this Zoom event as interactive and as inter-conversational um, as possible, which is why we are, we first of all would like to start uh, with a poll. So we want you to have your uh, hand on the on the keyboard. Uh, we are going to ask you a question, and that question is uh, now going to appear on the screen from Dane. Uh, and here's the question. So in your view, has the pandemic made democracy worse or better? Has it enhanced it, top, or threatened it? For you, first of all, for you, in your experience, you live more in a democracy or less in a democracy? And on your screen, you can click. Okay, so it seems that everybody has uh, thought that the state of democracy and the quality of democracy has been threatened individually for them. And also everyone has said that democracy has been threatened for the world. So that's the results of this poll. Well, that is very interesting. And that's really the sense that we usually have uh, in the pandemic. Uh, now, so you, you, you see, let, let me just to get a sense more precisely, because yes or no, this is where the way most polls go. And then it's a very simple way of doing democracy. Can we now uh, um, ask you to perhaps be a bit more um, detailed, uh, uh, think more through words? So if we ask you um, that, we would like you to go on, on the chat and use something many of you will be familiar with, which is the Mentimeter. And as you know, in, man, in a Mentimeter, you put words that come to mind. So we, when we put COVID and democracy together in your mind, we would like you to kind of say in the Mentimeter, okay. Freedom. You can put several words also if you want. Okay. So we, we have some, and sharing, cooperation, that's what, now the question really to think about, as we put these words on the, on the screen, sharing, trust, freedom, choice, cooperation, have they increased or not? This is what you think about when you think about democracy. And then we want to ask ourselves, have they increased or not during the COVID era? So now I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so, so in this festival, we, the reason why we want to do um, slides and interaction is, is very much that we have a spirit of discussion, interaction, conversation. And even though you're on Zoom, we, we hope you can feel a bit in a theater or in an, a public agora. A public is the same public for you in the Zoom, you in a theater, or you in politics, public opinions. And this is some of what we did last year in the IF Festival, where we tried to ask all of you to consider yourself as a chorus. And you are the people, the masses, the mob, whichever version of these words you think you are. And these publics are also the actors of conversation and of democracy. 
So you're the actor of democracy and we're asking today, pandemic politics, is it enhancing or threatening democracy? And of course, why should I tell you the result? This is why I wanted this poll. And you all went the 100% threatening. And we, I wanna hear um, what you're thinking of. What, what, is the, what is your thought uh, when you think it threatens democracy? Yes, power grabs, governments tell us what to do. They take emergency power. They curb all of our freedoms. So then the question is, well, what else is there? Uh, because what I want to do is actually provoke you a bit and try to uh, say, yeah, I get it. I agree. We've seen all of these curbings. We feel that democracy is threatened by a pandemic that allows governments and corporations to tell us what to do. But what if there was another story? So there are actually many stories, and this is you know images of how the pan democracy in a pandemic um, is threatened. We're, um, we're literally breathless and voiceless. Um, we are closing our space. That, that's the idea. But there is, a, a, and, and in that big, big debate, there is the question, well, maybe, you know, uh, authoritarian regimes are actually the winners in this story. If democracy are going to behave like dictatorships, might as well be in an authoritarian country like China, who's gonna really able to do away with the pandemic, right? So there is this big question, who is winning? Is democracy losing out? And many young people in Europe seem to be believing that. There is another frame, another way of this is important topic, which is, you know, it, are people more and more polarized around the pandemic? Those who want masks, lockdowns, those who don't, you know, is this a new divide in our society or, or people maybe more ambivalent? Um, it's more complicated than that. They hold all these feelings at the same time. And another frame, another way of seeing this question is whether who is winning out in this whole story? Is it the state, the one that's curbing us? But let me start planting some seeds of doubt here. Or is it civil society? Is it us? Because at the end of the day, well, you know what? The result, the outcome of this whole crisis is in our hands. Literally, if we wash our hands, we will do better, right? So who is more powerful? But then, of course, there is the democracy ledger. And that's what we want to concentrate on. All of these other questions, they flow into this this question, who is democracy the loser? Is, re, is it really the loser? Is it gonna lose out against other systems? Um, is civil society going to be crushed? Now, what I want to kind of appeal to is to you is, the, is, is, is really your democratic imagination, what I want to call your democratic imagination. Uh, that democracy needs to be imagined to exist. If people don't imagine themselves in a democracy, there's no democracy. And all we can do is collect some impressions from COVID. We, we don't really know what, what's gonna pan out, right? Um, and in fact, there are many thinkers who've thought of it that, that way, but there is some ideas out there, and especially around May 68, there was this whole you know, philosophers and others who thought about radical democracy as a kind of assertion of mutual responsibility. Because you know what, beforehand, democracy uh, didn't exist. It was figures of authority, gods, kings, emperors, nation, uh, that had the upper hand. Democracy is when suddenly society become aware that they are the authors of democracy. That's the definition, that there are the, the law of the people is the law of the land. So the question is what does COVID do for this agenda of what we could call radical democracy, that you are the authors of our politics. So I wanna to propose to you five metaphors and I'd like you to kind of, you know, if you're so inspired as I go through them, open the chat and Dane will look at the chat and voice your comments to me. 
if you have comments or questions for each of these metaphors, they're very short metaphors that I suggest to you to try to make the case that maybe you could change your mind in the polls. And here is the first one. The first one is the metaphor of theater. You know, pandemic is a necropolis. It's, it's a theater of death, right? Uh, and so the question is, how do we deal with the theater of death? How does authority deal with the theater of death? And here I suggest to you that um, this theater of death uh, is a theater of war, really. And indeed, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, whether it was Donald Trump or President Macron of France, and even to some extent, you know, Boris Johnson in the UK, it was all like a theater of war. You wore masks and you were, you know, you had to, you were in a theater of war. They kept on saying, we're at war with the, against the, the virus. Uh, you know, we have to, and they're like your generals, mobilizing society. But little by little, this whole story became a theater of care where the mask is the mask of life, not the mask of war. And where it's, it's all about our mutual responsibility. We are together in sickness and in hell, in, in, <laughs> and in hell, and in hell, right? And so the question for us is which one has seemed to triumph? Because when you have a theater of war, indeed you have the great leader who is in charge and people are powered into what they're told to do. When you have a theater of care, you, you're each responsible for each other and you celebrate the carers who are usually, you know, the underworld of society. So here I ask you the question, if you voted that, you know, uh, the pandemic crushes our democracy, you know, if, if we are little by little seeing that theater of care is what this is all about, if we're seeing that, you know, prime ministers or politicians who emphasize care, often prime minister women, uh, then doesn't this tell us something? Um, you know, you had Jacinda Ardern in Finland, Sana Marin, sorry, in, in New Zealand, Sarah Malin in Finland, and, and many other women, especially, who tended to talk about caring. So if it's really a theater of care, doesn't that open up another idea of, of democracy and the pandemic? Any thoughts that you might have? You know, please put it in the in the chat. You can just put one word, whether you agree or disagree, or what you know, if you have a story, or if you believe that this matters or not. Um, sorry. Um, Adain, I'm just gonna give it twenty seconds if anyone is inspired to put something in the chat. So certainly there's, uh, there's the idea that this social media has sort of shown every bump and scrape along the way, I think, there's that sort of the theatre has been exposed to everyone, so people have seen more um, rather than possibly in uh, previous periods in time when you know, state uh, controls or institutional controls kind of media have met, you know, created a message and projected that message, whereas a sort of a democratized kind of media um, theater has allowed people to kind of say what they want to say. And that for some has been uncomfortable and for some has been empowering and for some has been um, truth and for some has been lies. So I think the kind of optics of messaging has been quite different. Um, I don't know if anybody yeah. else has any other views. Yeah, and in a way it makes sense because the, the social media, for better or worse, democratizes, makes more democratic this whole theater role play, this whether we're going to be at war or we're going to be at care. Uh, and whether, and as you say, sometimes um, there's all sorts of extreme feelings, but they're all played out in a kind of collective theater um but what do we think that that does to our democracy um wouldn't you say or what i would you know suggest is that um 
it does actually um, create a conversation. Um, it certainly does, doesn't it? It's, it creates a conversation and it, one of those things about democracy, it's people might disagree, but people will defend other people's rights to disagree with them. So exactly. even, though, even though we're not sort of agreeing with everything that's going on, it's all been given ban, it's been given airtime. And usually that doesn't happen in a war. In a war you're told, look, in a national uh, emergency, national interest, you can't start disagreeing. We have an enemy here. And so the propaganda the machine. Mm -hmm. And a propaganda machine is taking and over the message. Propaganda machine. And in the in the pandemic, what we had is what we would say: it's agency, your agent, you have your freedom. You mobilize instead of being mobilized, right? Uh, you have rights. You you know you what whichever they are. So at least we're planting here the seed of the question you know that if it's a theater there's all these contradictory exchanges if people care about who cares for who then maybe this is a democratic space that is opened up that we don't have in the times of war let let why don't we move on to our second metaphor uh here and that second th metaphor is bubbles uh, now, bubbles, of course, we all know what they were before the pandemic, you know, these exactly what Dane was just talking about, the media bubble, social media bubble, I'm in my little bubble, I don't listen to other. Uh, uh, but this was a moment where society know thyself. Remember when the first time Boris Johnson went on TV and said, hey, there is R, the reproduction rate, and we have R equals one. We have to bring the curve down. And you could imagine everyone sitting in their sofas and pulling the R curve down, pulling it down together. You know, we have to do something. So this curve goes down. Um, so this is like as a moment when uh, the contract that the great leader <laughs> with quotes offers our, our family is simple. Bring, keep the R down and the authorities will ease restriction. So it's in your hands. So, you know, how democratic we are is in your hand. And in a way, the social uh, appropriation is, is the key to this whole thing. If people think it's our business to bring R down, then it will, it will work. Uh, you know, if there's not too many free riders, you say, oh, I'll let my neighbors do it. Uh, but also if you're a free rider, everyone will see that you're a free rider, right? Um, so, so there is a question of what is the size of my bubble, but suddenly, uh, you know, these bubbles are, um, are, are bubbles, are bubbles of care, and we want to enlarge them, so it's maybe it's only our families, but then it becomes the whole neighborhood, or it becomes my friends, and you have all these bubble memes. And all these bubble memes are usually a metaphor for conveying something very important. What is my responsibility to, to others? Which others, where, how big, how many? How do I do it? And I'm trying to make the bubble bigger, not smaller, to expand this responsibility outwards. I invite people to, in my bubble. Uh, so here we have a, a, a kind of metaphor that tells us about the value of this R, which is as a kind of measure of sociability, of how much we can be together and mutually responsible for each other. Um, and mutual is important, right? So that's the, that's the second metaphor. And it, it, it makes us think of democracy as kind of like all these bubbles that are trying to be bubbles of care. But it's also about how collectively, as a whole nation, we own R. It doesn't belong to the Johnson government, or the Macron government, right? It, be it belongs to us. Our salvation is with a low R and we are its master. So and any comments in the chat on this? Dane? Dane? So possibly this, uh, the idea of the fragility of this bubble so, you know, how fragile is the membrane um, and can it burst easily or can it expand? Yeah. Uh, also a comment on the restrictions of 
personal behavior for public health um, perceived as authoritarianism. So uh, having to kind of, you know, there, there was the kind of half an hour of government mandated exercise that you should do, but no more than that. And so there was a, obviously there was the huge restrictions on what people could do. Um, and is that kind of helping uh, collectively or is it hindering individuals? And That's so cool. Yeah, the fragility bubbles, you know, whoa, they're so easy to pop, right? Uh, they are very fragile. That's how we think of bubbles. And yet, you know, you can kind of, in this case, we, we were supposed to nurture our bubbles and they were pretty rigid bubbles. Nobody comes in the house, right? Uh, and then you've got, yeah, personal behavior. Uh, the government was telling us exactly how many people we had in our bubble and how many could come home and were there in our family. So it's like a third degree cousin in my family or, you know, how intrusive should the government be in defining this bubble? And what I would believe, but do you all agree, is that if we appropriate R, what happens to reproduction, then in a way, let us government, you know, decide that. And, you know, let, don't tell us how many, how much you, we should exercise it. But if we want to exercise, if we're careful that it respects the, the bubble, then let us do it. Indeed. Cool. So it sounds like you were inspired by the bubble idea or the, the new, new, new definition of bubbles from before. Let's move to our third metaphor, because at the end of this very short presentation, we'll open to Q&A, um, not just the chat. But for the moment, we now have the strings. Now, this is perhaps the metaphor that will be the least familiar to you, because it's a metaphor that has to do with uh, the, the social space, our social space, that it's always imagined. You know, how far, so there's a lot of stories about social space, how far you could go from your home, how many kilometers, um, what, you know, what is kind of safe socializing, if you do jogging or whatever, prohibition of what you can do in public. Uh, and before you could just walk around, do whatever you want, right? Now here I use a metaphor, which is the string, because it's the Eruv. Now, many of you might not be familiar with this Jewish tradition, which is to say that we, why is it all about strings? Well, because um, in the Jewish tradition on Saturday, some of you will know, uh, you cannot carry anything. It, it's the day of rest. So you can't even carry your baby in a pram or fruit to the neighbor. But in order to create a socially acceptable life on Saturdays, rabbis decided that we had little eruvs in neighborhoods or in a courtyard. And these, these were like um, transforming a public space into a private space. And if, you, if something was called an eruv, you could do all of these things that were forbidden. But with modernity, with time, it became necessary to make bigger and bigger eruv to the point where entire towns became eruvs. And it was because they were surrounded by say walls. And we just said, okay, that's in that you can carry stuff. But when the Jews arrived, uh, well, sometimes in Europe, but mostly in the US, they started, there were no walls around the cities. So they started to put strings around in the sky, which you would not notice if you're not Jewish. But these defines like the invisible walls of Eruv. And suddenly Jews can walk around, you know, Manhattan. Uh, as if it was a private space. And in the Eruv, you're also supposed to contribute to what others do. And I started to ask myself and others, isn't the COVID moment like a moment when we're trying to reinvent our public space as a space that's not ruleless, but that has, uh, it's a new shared space. And it's about how do, can we allow for interaction to continue to be social? But there is a background of prohibitions, things you can't do, because everyone is a potential, and I put it in quote, carrier, carrier of the virus, as opposed to carrier of a baby pram. And so um, the pandemic basically reminds us that classical liberalism, freedom, the idea that people should do what they 
want as long as they don't harm others is not enough. It's a good start, but it's not enough. Uh, in fact, the public space carries it with it responsibility, a set of rules. So it's all about having a certain empathy, knowing that it's not a stranger in the room. You have, you're, you're crossing somebody's path. You're in a shop, you know, you have a responsibility to workers. Uh, you know, the spaces are commonly owned, our shared green spaces, our shops, uh, and, and, you know, even the common spaces that Dane was talking about in our apps, they, they need to be safe spaces for, for the pandemic. Uh, and we need to empower each other to be able to be free within those space with these common rules. And so the question is, are we becoming uh, conscious that these spaces, we co-create them, we're all responsible for these spaces together? If, if we are, if the pandemic made us more responsible for a democratic conversation about these boundaries, then maybe it is as an enhance our sense of democracy. So Dane, do we have some comments there in the chat? Yeah, so just thinking about these strings and the ties that bind us, there's a note about sort of transmissibility and the notion of track and trace and sort of seeing what connections are being made and someone's put in the, a cobweb and sort of getting trapped possibly in this sort of mesh of connections and possibly becoming immobile or, or feeling stuck. That might be one of the ideas um, around strings and connections. I can't see the chat, but I can just imagine that cobweb. <laughs> and that is so cool. And you know, we, so we're trapped in all these strings and all these rules and what you can do and how far. And the question is, do you, do you see the cobweb? If you see the web, you know, maybe that's kind of interesting because you're like, oh, it's not an empty space. There are rules, but maybe there are rules about mutual responsibility. They feel oppressive, but don't I own, can I own them? You know, what can I do with them? Let's move on to the next, um, the fourth and fifth metaphor quickly so we can now see each other afterwards. So this, this next metaphor is about circles and it's about the idea. So here you see all these circles of different size. And it's about the idea that, you know, if you're an individual, you're the center of your own little circle or you're this, or then your family, that's another circle, your neighborhood, the other neighborhood, they overlap, they intersect, countries intersect, regions intersect. And, and so maybe what the, the fundamental consciousness that we have in this moment is about autonomy, these circles of autonomy. I am autonomous within this circle, but to be really autonomous, maybe I need a bigger circle or another circle, smaller, bigger, I'm not sure. So if we have circles of autonomy, maybe we, we won't see anymore the government as this like vertical thing. There is me, tiny little me, powerless me, and then there's the big government above me. And then maybe above that, there's the EU or the world government or something. No, it's not vertical. It's just like a whole big sea of different circles that I belong to some of them and not to others. So it's a kind of a, a new game of scale and we're all diverse and we play differently in these different circles. So, you know, we have the confinement of the household, the, the, the regions, the state, all of these uh, organize a kind of like, we're, we're a bit independent within them. We're, we, we try not to be too dependent on people outside those circles. I don't know if it's good or bad for democracy, but um, maybe you have your optimal circles. Uh, and maybe it, we're, we're deciding more now with the pandemic, we're more conscious of having to decide our preferred circles. And they really have consequence, can be a matter of life and death, what is my preferred circles. Dane, any, uh, do you feel comfortable with these new circles of autonomy? Any comment? Uh, there's a comment about, um, do you remember where the circle started? Will it end? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, also, and also then imagining how, as this uh, 
drawing that you have on the screen looks like how does a Venn diagram show kind of the intersection of what people care about maybe it might be that um, someone cares about something that someone else doesn't or maybe someone cares about something that someone else does and those Venn diagrams overlap and it might be that there are um, common and um, yeah, common sort of things that people care about. So maybe caring for an older relative or somebody who's um, immunocompromised, for instance, or it might be that some people's circles don't overlap at all because they, they feel like they shouldn't have to wear a mask or they shouldn't be vaccinated or they shouldn't comply to all of these authoritarian style rules. So there might be overlapping uh, concerns but there also might be quite big gaps between these different circles. That is so beautifully said and so much like putting in words the picture that we have there on the screen and the idea somehow that um, at least we see that. I mean, there, some may be oppressive, these circles that overlap or not, but they become more visible to us. So our social world social ability, how, how we are together, somehow becomes more visible because it is a matter of life and death. So we start thinking about these circles. And that's a kind of interesting way to think our, in our democracies, right? So let me give you the last metaphor be, before we open up. So this is about mirrors. And it's about the idea that we, we became mirrors for each other. I give you a picture here of the, one of the first big demonstration in Tel Aviv at the beginning of the pandemic where people socially distanced and protested at the same time. So their politics and, you know, people protested in all sorts of ways all around the world, right? At their windows and, and in masks, but with masks. And, um, and there, there was a sense that everybody was watching everybody's creativity and mutual respect in protesting. Now there were all sorts of protests. They are not all made equal. Uh, but all these acts were acting as if we're all watching each other, watching each other. So there's this infinite game of mirrors across the world. Five billion people in lockdown protesting or expressing their solidarity with care workers. But at the same time, it's a global scene that is also about time. It's about our own follies as humanities and maybe our redemption. So it's also about time. Uh, it's about the Anthropocene because, of course, COVID is climate change on steroids. And people understood that, that this is about something problematic we did with nature. And now we're bearing the consequence, boom, like that. But with climate change, it's coming slower, but it's going to be even more apocalyptic. So, so we are trying to kind of see what kind of democratic performance we can uh, we can show where we are connected to deal with this global phenomenon, this global moment in a game of mirrors. And so maybe that helps our democracy. Is there any comments on that before we conclude? Uh, I suppose you know, in this sort of who's looking at whom so do we see ourselves reflected back and what do we choose to look at and so people who are protesting in a crowd you're getting to see people who are doing the same sort of thing as you um, so maybe there's something around there is that sort of echo almost an echo chamber possibly but then if people are kind of testing out and sort of protesting and they're trying to reflect what their views are onto other people so that I, yeah I'm not sure it's sort of do we see ourselves reflected back I think is the is the comment do we see ourselves? and maybe that's just a question we need to ask ourselves I'm watching all these others on the media and and how what do they inspire in me do I see a collective that's responsible or irresponsible but that we see each other in each other in space and in time. Uh, uh, maybe we, we are ready for a social and ecological state of emergency altogether because 
there's going to be less free riders. We identify the free riders somehow. And maybe that reflects back, as you say, Dane, on how I should behave. So this all leads us, I guess, in conclusion to you know, opening up a conversation, maybe to ask whether COVID uh, is a stress test for democracy. Yes, with hugely unequal impact across the world, but opening this political imagination in different ways uh, maybe there is a, a transnational and a transgenerational moment. And, you know, I gave you just a few impression, a few horizon, a few intuitions about what we could call the pandemic democratic pedagogy. Uh, but I think that we see that people in a way want even more to be in control of their destiny and deny that the state has a monopoly to tell us how we should be together. Uh, that somehow globality has become more intimate um, and, and we're, we're, has exposed the power of a deeper universal, which is our democratic universal. And, 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 and I hope that you know, our children uh, will benefit from this moment. This is my, my hope. They, they will benefit from a, a kind of wake up call that puts us in a much, much longer, long durée where nature and humans are intrinsically connected and where our democracies must be there to serve the long term. And that's quite a challenge, but hopefully it will be one of the lessons of this pandemic. So I, I just want to leave you with this thought and with maybe the idea that, um, that after all, COVID is not so antithetic, so negative for democracy. So what do you think? I mean, at the end, in, in a few minutes, when we close, we will have a last poll to see if you've changed your mind at all. But in the meanwhile, let's, let's open up. I'm gonna stop sharing uh, and um, come back to us. Great. Thanks, Gipso. Some really good uh, provocations there. And so if anybody wants to unmute themselves and say something, or if you want to type anything in the chat, about any ideas that have come to mind as a result of some of those metaphors. I mean, we certainly, it certainly highlighted an aspect of society that possibly has already been kind of building and the sort of 15 minutes of fame kind of, what was it Andy Warhol, I forget, um, who said, we'll all have 15 minutes of fame in the future uh, and people, saying what they feel and getting more exposure um, around lots of different people kind of saying very different things again rather than having this um, single voice or the, um, the sort of propaganda machine that ordinarily would kind of be a company or company a national crisis like a war or some other kind of you know massive problem and so with the advent of social media and the kind of democratic nature of that media maybe democracy is a bit uglier and a bit messier than what we originally might have thought of you know if democracy has been strengthened is democracy what we want if this is you know if we get lots more people kind of saying their own viewpoints and more people are agreeing but also at the same time more people are disagreeing like or would it be better to just silence voices and just have a single voice? Um, so is, is that sort of, uh, was it so changed? I would, or? I, I would take, I'd take the risk, you know, yeah, social media, there's a lot of weirdo things and opinions we may not like and people in the call might not like, but on the other hand, uh, that's the risk of democracy, right? You can't just say, oh, I'm the elite, I'm the guardian of good taste and what's right to do or I'm the expert, you know, democracy is taking risks and letting, you know, people uh, decide that in ancient Rome, you know, there was the pleb and you could make speeches and try to convince people or here in, in well, I mean, in the, all the republics, all the original democracies, you know, people just express themselves and you could say, well, they're demagogues, etc. but at the end of the day, you know, human beings are supposed to have the power in their own hands. So, but many doubt that, and especially now that we're an era of scientists deciding, but scientists themselves often tell us, look, I don't want to decide what society should do. 
I can tell you what R is, but I can't tell you what all your, you know, what will make you behave better or what, this is about you, not about me, says the scientist who is wise, you know? I think it was Churchill that said democracy is the worst form of government, except all the others. <laughs> it's sort of like it's it's messy, isn't it? But that's part of part of its use, I suppose, is that because there are so many views available, the alternative is to have a, an autocracy and there's only one view and that can never be challenged. Or the alternative is to have uh, either an autocracy or, you know, increasingly big corporations that might decide what uh, what the algorithm will, will show everyone and won't. And we know this with the controversies around Facebook. And that's and which one is more scary, a state or a corporation that is going to kind of carve our minds. And of course, the pandemic is scary because it has increased these, you know, this taking of our personal data and all the rest of it. But then the reverse is, re is true too. It has also increased how conscious we are that this is happening, that I can have an app which will know everything about me. We're even more conscious than we were before. So if, if, the, if the pandemic creates a problem, but also creates a consciousness of the problem, which one is, which one is more, which one should we note? Which one is more important? If the problem was already there, but we have the awareness of it now. At least we have the awareness. And that's something. So I wonder, uh, where do we go from here, do you think, Calypso, in terms of how we feel like we should shape our society? Do we feel like we have control over it? How can we influence what we want to see in the world? So based on your the research that you're doing and the kind of international kind of diplomatic networks that you're connected with, are there are there ideas and movements to try and support open, free, I mean, dare I say, liberal democracy? Or do you think there are kind of steps that people are taking to maybe go down that road of let's have a numb society that sort of just ticks on by? Do you have any feelings well, for that? Well, I mean, <laughs> above all, uh, I, I, what I'm trying to say with the appropriation of R, you know, and the, the idea that people are getting now that, well, it's in their hands, it's their, the sum of all their behaviors that will produce the outcome, is that I very much hope they keep that mindset, the sense that it's in our hand, that our collective destiny is in our hand. You know, it needs to be nurtured by each of us, but also by power, powerful actors, by governments, by corporations at school, you know, it's a very old, old, old idea that we're each responsible for the collective. But in an era of global climate change and biodiversity threat and all of that, each of our small acts contributes to, to the bigger good. And, um, and the pandemic has made it so clear. Yeah, you need some guidelines, but at the end of the day, you know, if everybody revolts against the guideline or does, it won't work. People creatively need to appropriate them that this is how I interpret them. This is how I will eat and exercise and meet other people or not meet other people or greet them in these billions of little acts every day. So I think if the consciousness of that is spread, that is the it's great beginning. And then, of course, we need to also think about the big picture in terms of power, in terms of all the things that you were all afraid of at the beginning. <clears throat> the way in which dem democracy is threatened, uh, we hope that we need to hope and push for, for all of these things to be reversed when executives take on emergency power, curb our freedoms, that is temporary. And we need to be all the more vigilant about this than before because we've seen it. We also need societies who care about people who care, who do the care, societies of care. Isn't that so critical that if we finally realize how important it is 
to nurture all the people who care for others, when actually they tend to be the ones who earn the least, who are the least valued. So I think there's been a kind of a change here in our societies and that's really a big progress. But again, all of these things, we hope it's not a blip, a pandemic moment. You know, we, let's hope that it will be, that it will be um, amplified and nurtured you know, in the future. So just coming back to your idea of the reproduction rate, that infamous curve that we saw so many times that had two shapes. There was the very steep curve that went up very high, or there was the flatten the curve, the kind of slightly flatter version of this thing. And I suppose you're saying that that was a, a description of the reproduction rate of the virus, but it could also be any other kind of public health issue like diabetes, smoking, um, alcohol abuse, if, if everyone kind of, you know, the kind of sometimes when we kind of think back, I don't know, the Roaring Twenties maybe and the prohibition era of the US and how society is looking to kind of change and control itself and keep in check some of its behaviours. We've noticed how even after social pressure and kind of medical research that uh, people have wanted to kind of reduce the amount of sugar in processed foods or salt in processed foods. So that might be one example of how to kind of control the society. Another one might be, as you say, around maybe voting patterns towards making sure that key workers are given decent salaries and teachers and other kind of, you know, healthcare professionals. What about sort of stay at home volunteer carers, the role of, you know, traditionally the role of a female in a sort of heteronormative relationship that has a big caring responsibility. Should that be shared? Should that kind of pressure be expanded throughout your know, society? Even the idea of, um, I mean, it was terrible with the, the George Floyd and the resulting Black Lives Matter kind of campaign that came out of that, an awareness of institutional racism and people kind of being aware of issues and wanting to correct for that. So you're saying that the kind of individual actions and the collective kind of direction that some of these actions support, it, it's almost kind of coming back to that um, Mahatma Gandhi kind of quote of be, you know, be the change that you want to see in the world and how individual acts can influence. And it comes back to the mirror metaphor possibly of how do we want to kind of see ourselves reflected and how do we want to see other people reflected? Can you be the role model that you'd like to see other people to be? And does that mean just being kinder? Um, is that what you mean by the sort of using the R? Uh, you've said it much better than, than I did. And, it's, and, and you have, Jane, appropriated for yourself, the meaning that you give R as responsibility, you know, R as for responsibility and not just for reproduction, and but for any, uh, for taking back control, but in a good way of what we should be responsible for, and and some and we can't be responsible for everything. So when you when when we think about Black Lives Matter, which was about breathing, I mean that was a great irony. I can't breathe is is the same slogan for the pandemic and in, in, and in the tra terrible tragedy that we witnessed. And so there's always the two sides of the, of the coin. There is witnessing the huge, huge injustices and how we are differently vulnerable, more or less vulnerable in this moment. And, but if you are less vulnerable, if you're more privileged, more protected, then indeed it's time to think about when and where your responsibility, and maybe you've done this all your life, and pande the pandemic is a moment where you talk about it with your neighbor and each of us goes through this journey. And to me, it does give me hope that democracy will become more mature uh, with this moment. But, you know, call me an idealist, but it's all right. <laughs> I'll be fine with that. So maybe we can leave it at that, Dane, because you really gave, the, gave it a, a wonderful final summing up. And maybe um, call for a last poll to see if oh, yes. anyone has changed the their mind. Poll to see if we have any changes in views. So. And uh, Tanya is, is commenting that she still feels threatened, but thank you. But thank you, Tanya, for also saying this made you think again. And we hope that those of you online
will send in their ideas and commentary to enlarge the conversation. Um, but one of the things, certainly one of the things that's come out of Oxford in the recent few years that the festival has been supported is this group of uh, English literature students and history students that are looking uh, at uncomfortable Oxford. And so they're trying to encourage a sense of discomfort in some of even Oxford's past in terms of its history, its literature and its cultural kind of projection worldwide. And certainly one of the things that I think is coming out of the past few years is that there is a, a pervasive discomfort with um, being a living person in the world today. And in some ways, there's something comfortable about that discomfort, that if, if everything was so easy the whole time, maybe we wouldn't notice um, how, how connected we are and how our responsibilities have implications on other people. Um, so we've had some answers to the poll and we have a split now. So some people think democracy has been enhanced as a result of the pandemic and some people think it's been threatened. So maybe there's a, possibly a greater nuance of what democracy means and where the responsibilities lie. And it's possibly something around this level of constant discomfort. And if we can be comfortable with that, maybe it comes back to the sort of the ambivalence and the sort of strength in ambivalence. Um, I don't know. Okay, so would you like to offer any thoughts? No, I'm just that um, I'm quite glad that the polls show that uh, some some of you have changed your mind. Uh, and I'm all equally fine with the fact that some of you haven't, as long as some doubt has been planted that, well, there might also be a, a less negative, less dark side to the story of democracy in the pandemic. So as long as we see both sides of the moon, I think we can work, you know, work together and continue the journey. So thank you, Dane, and thank you, everybody who tuned in. Well, thanks so much, Calypso. That was really, really thoughtful and just a great, a great conversation to have. It's really important to kind of surface these political ideas and broaden how we experience the world. So thanks so much. Thanks everyone for joining in and we're hoping to see you at some more events in the future. Goodbye, see you next time.